Today on Earth Focus, nuclear power, the downside. Miles Benson reports on where nuclear insurance falls short. And Dr. Helen Caldicott on the health effects of nuclear radiation. Coming up on Earth Focus. An earthquake and tsunami struck Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant. Three reactors suffered a meltdown. The Japanese government has raised the crisis level at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant from five to seven. The confirmed death toll continues to climb. Hundreds of thousands fled the radiation. Many are still unable to return home. Property damages and cleanup costs may run over $250 billion. The operator of the disabled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has agreed to make provisional damage payments to residents living around the plant. What if it happened in the United States? Who would pay? A catastrophe like Fukushima could erase all existing insurance protection under federal law. It makes the U.S. liability compensation system look grossly inadequate. There are 104 nuclear power plants in the U.S. spread across 31 states. They produce 20% of our electrical power. They all carry some insurance against a nuclear accident, but the combined total coverage is only $12.6 billion. Beyond that, Americans would be uninsured, or as the insurance industry puts it, naked. If you have to evacuate a very large city, or tens or hundreds of thousands of people are displaced, and that there are very large areas of land that are rendered uninhabitable for tens to hundreds of years, the, it gets to the point where it, you know, the estimation of the damages and the costs to the government become inestimable, uh, incalculable. Nuclear accidents are costly. Some experts say an extreme event here could cost as much as $500 billion or more. My colleagues and I did a number of estimates uh, based on the spent fuel catching fire at reactors, and some of these estimates went into the hundreds of billions of dollars. So why is the liability cap for insurance only $12.6 billion if the actual cost of a disaster could be far greater? Now, clearly, after Fukushima, uh, $12 billion doesn't look like nearly enough. Raising the cap would be costly. The nuclear industry says $12.6 billion is enough because nuclear power is safe and the probability of a major accident low. I think that the amount of coverage is adequate. Uh, we have seen that uh, in the Three Mile Island accident, uh, the, uh, the amount was far below the amount of, of coverage provided. We have no other experience in the United States of, a, of an accident that would reach the level of $12.6 billion, and none is expected given the, given the strong safety standards uh, uh, enforced by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We have uh, a very strong regulatory process, a set of regulations. We do inspections. We have a strong enforcement process to, to handle when when regulations aren't being followed. And those things all combined, you know, help to give us continued assurance that, that nuclear power is safe. After Fukushima, steps were taken to review safety at U.S. nuclear plants. Right now, we are a um, little bit more than two-thirds of the way through a 90-day uh, review that we're doing to see if there are any immediate short-term issues that need to be addressed uh, to deal with the events at Fukushima. Fukushima reinvigorated this discussion of how NRC considers land contamination economic consequences within its regulatory framework and also if the NRC would like to do anything differently in the future. We're always looking for ways to improve the regulatory process and, and how we regulate the civilian uses of, of nuclear materials. But some experts are concerned about safety and regulations. Today, U.S. nuclear power plants are aging. Built to last 40 years, more than half are at least 30 years old. 
if we're going to have nuclear power, then we believe it has to be as safe and secure as possible. And uh, we've been long concerned that neither in the United States or other countries is the regulatory infrastructure adequate to make sure nuclear plants are safe. I think that, the, that there is reasonable assurance that we're never going to have a catastrophic accident of the magnitude of what happened in Japan. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. You know, it can be the black swan event, low probability of occurrence, but high impact. Today, six million Americans live within 10 miles of a nuclear plant, and 120 million live within 50 miles. But nobody can buy private insurance against damage to their property because of a radiation leak or other consequences of a nuclear accident. The nuclear industry was born in the 1950s when the U.S. government was determined to promote the civilian use of nuclear energy. President Dwight D. Eisenhower had a dream. He called it Atoms for Peace. So my country's purpose is to help us move out of the dark chamber of horrors into the light, to find a way by which the minds of men, the hopes of men, the souls of men everywhere can move forward toward peace and happiness and well-being. It is not enough to take this weapon out of the hands of the soldiers. It must be put into the hands of those who will know how to strip its military casing and adapt it to the arts of peace. Nuclear power was to benefit mankind but the free market insurance industry was unwilling to cover nuclear accident risk because it was immeasurable and potential economic damages were incalculable. So to encourage and protect investment in nuclear power, Congress passed the Price-Anderson Act in 1957, which created an insurance pool and capped the amount of liability a commercial nuclear power plant would face should a disaster occur. Well, the thinking that went into the creation of the Price-Anderson Act back in the 50s was that in the event of a catastrophic accident, uh, no single uh, utility would be able, uh, from a financial standpoint, to with, uh, withstand that kind of loss. But it was always designed primarily with the view that the accident would probably be the destruction of the physical facility itself, and it wasn't ever thought about, you know, a catastrophic accident that went far beyond the plant's uh, geographic borders and into the surrounding community. When Price-Anderson was first adopted, uh, there was $60 million of insurance and $500 million of United States government indemnity. The act was later amended to provide that all of the money would come from private sources. At the present time, the first tier is composed of uh, insurance of $375 million. If that were not adequate, then each operator of the 104 uh, nuclear power plants would be assessed about $111 million. This totals uh, about $12.6 billion. Anything beyond that would, uh, is not covered by insurance, and it would be up to Congress to decide whether they wanted to appropriate the, uh, the funds. If we start talking about four or five hundred billion dollars, there is no way that any politician is going to vote for the public to take on that kind of liability. You cannot tell Congress that in the future at some time they're going to have to pass a law to provide many, many more billions of dollars in case of a nuclear accident. That's a fairy tale. I think we have a 16 trillion dollar deficit right now. <clears throat> It would obviously probably have to be uh, some kind of deficit financing uh, with major implications for, for the economy and uh, for the, maybe even the value of the dollar in the worst case of scenario in the world economy. The way it works is that many of these uh, reactors are now owned by multi-tiered holding companies that have layers and layers of what they call limited liability corporations beneath them. And each LLC basically represents a reactor and has no other assets. The whole concept of a limited liability corporation by, by, by virtue of its definition is to shield the parent corporation from liability. What 
happens under these corporate structures is that if such an accident of such great magnitude were to occur, these limited liability corporations could promptly declare bankruptcy and shield the parent corporation that, that leaves the taxpayer holding the bag to pay for the liability. Only Congress, with the president's approval, can raise the mandated level of insurance coverage against nuclear accidents. There's been no sign they intend to do so, and the nuclear industry is quite happy with that. It's sort of short-term greed. Uh, that what drives the industry uh, more than anything is making as much money as quickly as possible uh, and as long as possible without incurring any, any large expenses that would cut into their profits. It's that simple. Two years after Fukushima, costs continue to pile up. It will probably be decades before the full scope of the expenses is known. Japanese government officials admit that the overall consequences are too broad to fix an accurate price on the disaster. Cleanup and property damage claims by homeowners, businesses, including 80,000 farms, are already running five to 10 times higher than initial expectations. TEPCO, the Tokyo corporation that operated the nuclear plant, is now virtually bankrupt. Japan's leaders are struggling to continue payouts to tens of thousands of their citizens who may never be able to return to homes contaminated by radiation. Adding to the financial burden now are collapsing property values in contaminated areas and related increases nationally in the costs of alternative coal, gas, and oil. And then there is another human dimension the slow future unfolding of cancer cases in those exposed to contaminants, particularly children. In February 2013, a World Health Organization report said that radiation from Fukushima posed minimal health risk to the general population of Japan. But the WHO acknowledged that emergency workers at the plant who inhaled high doses of radioactive iodine face an increased risk of developing thyroid cancer and that children exposed as infants in areas closest to the power plant have a slightly elevated risk of contracting leukemia, breast, or thyroid cancer in their lifetimes. Critics say that the health impacts of Fukushima are far from insignificant and will increasingly be evident over time. One of the harshest of these critics is longtime anti-nuclear activist Dr. Helen Caldicott, a pediatrician and author. She offered a far more dire view of Fukushima's health impacts soon after the disaster. Dr. Caldicott, Fukushima. Is it possible to forecast the health consequences to the Japanese people, and on what scale are they likely to materialize? Well, it's a guess, really, but I have been following it extremely closely every day since the thing started. And I, I must say that two days after it began, I got this horrifying horrifying vision and feeling that this was like descending into hell and that there's nothing anyone could do about it or will be able to do about it and the results are irreversible. I thought hundreds of thousands would die um, as a result of Fukushima with cancer or leukaemia and but it will also affect future generations down the time scale both from the fact that the food and the ground in large areas of Japan is heavily contaminated with isotopes that last for hundreds of years. So they, they, they reconcentrate back in the food chain continuously. So you never get rid of the things. The other thing is that once you've got some cesium-137 in your brain or your muscle or your ovary or your testicle or any of the other several hundred elements, they stay in a little place in your body irradiating a few cells with a high dose. So you don't get a low dose. Those cells get a high dose. So from two perspectives, the accident kind of never ends. It doesn't end in your body. Maybe one day you might excrete these elements, but you might not. And that the food chain remains contaminated for hundreds or thousands of years. And we'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think two to five years from now. 
and then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. What do people need to know about nuclear power in the United States that they are not being told? Everything. It just makes me feel nauseated to think that the industry is spending hundreds of millions of dollars saying that nuclear power is clean, green, sustainable and cheap. And it's, all of those are lies. And I, you know, I get very sick of scientists or people who lie about science. If I lied about medicine, I would be deregistered. I would be damaging my patients. It is totally inappropriate and immoral to lie about science. Nuclear power, A, produces large quantities of global warming gas because it relies on a massive industrial infrastructure of mining, enriching um, two huge coal fire plants to enrich your uranium, building huge reactors, knocking them down in 30, 40 years, storing radioactive wastes for half a million years. I mean, none of that is taken into account. So nuclear power adds substantially to global warming. That's lie number one. Two, it's not cheap because it's all paid for by tax dollars, except when the reactor's built. And even then the utilities don't pay any insurance. If there's an accident, you taxpayers pick it up. The utilities make money by selling electricity. That's all. They don't have to build the reactors. It's all subsidised and paid for. I mean, no other industry has that sort of subsidisation. And do you know why? Because it's the prodigal son of the weapons industry. And when nuclear power was begun by Eisenhower in the 50s, atoms for peace, the weapons industry said we require nuclear power as a sort of Trojan horse, camouflage to hide behind. And then, and then everyone said it was safe. The Japanese didn't want nuclear power after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but they were talked into it. Uh, so it's a really wicked, wicked industry. And any country that has a reactor, be it Syria, Saudi Arabia, you name it, they have a bomb factory. Because each reactor makes 500 pounds of plutonium a year. Plutonium lasts for half a million years. And all you need is five pounds to make yourself a nuclear weapon. So by selling nuclear power abroad, which America is heavily into, it is causing proliferation of nuclear weapons which it says it's not, but it is. And that could trigger a global holocaust between Russia and America, who still target each other with thousands of nuclear weapons. Does the average doctor understand the full risks involved with radiation in nuclear power plants? No, we're not taught about the medical implications of nuclear power in medical schools. We, we did get some curricula going, Physicians for Social Responsibility in the 80s in medical schools, about nuclear war, but also nuclear power. It's a very, very interesting subject, but one about which most doctors are fairly ignorant. I would suggest, though, that all doctors obtain a copy from the New York Academy of Sciences uh, on Chernobyl. That was published last year, and, and they, there they translated 5,000 articles from Slavic, from Russian, into English that were published in the Russian medical uh, and, lit and scientific literature. Over a million people now have already died as a result of Chernobyl. It's only, it's only 25 years old. Over a million. And that has been covered up by the blasted UN, by the International Atomic Energy Agency. How dare they? And the World Health Organization. This is the biggest cover-up in the history of medicine. I have never read anything like this in my life. And I've been a doctor since I was 23. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has asked the National Academy of Sciences to do some research on incidents of cancer in the vicinity of nuclear plants all over the United States. Is that going to be a helpful study, do you think? Yes and no. The National Academy of Sciences has conducted for seven consecutive occasions a thing called the biological effects of ionising radiation. And they, they, they put out a report recently, number seven, and it was a good report. And it said no radiation is safe, radiation is cumulative. And yes, I trust them. 
there's a huge push by the industry to prevent re really decent research being done. But in a way, it's unnecessary because the German government, and the Germans are very precise with their data, examined, I think, 16 old reactors and looked at children under the age of five who lived within 5K of the reactors. And they had more than double the incidence of leukemia. Children are 10 to 20 times more radiosensitive than adults. More than double the incidence of leukemia and a high incidence of solid cancers. And the closer they lived to the reactor, the higher the incidence of malignancy. Now that study is absolutely classical. You can't find any holes in it at all. And in a way, it doesn't need to be repeated. The data's there. It's not just cancer, it's deformed children as well, isn't it? If, if, a, if a fetus, a normal, genetically chromosomally normal fetus, um, is exposed to a tiny bit of plutonium that lodges in its brain, developing brain, it can kill the cell that's going to form the right half of the brain or the left arm. That's called teratogenesis, damage of a normal fetus. And that's what that drug thalidomide did when women took it for morning sickness and their babies were born with no arms or no legs. It does that. It also, plutonium in particular, which is highly mutagenic, lodges in the testicles. It has a predilection for testicles and it lodges next to the spermatogonia, the cells that form the sperm, the precursors. And it's an alpha emitter, highly mutagenic, so it can mutate genes in the sperm to induce genetic mutations and genetic disease down the generations. Now, there are two sorts of mutations. Dominant, so if you have a baby with a dominant mutation, like brown eyes, the baby will have brown eyes, or dwarfism, achondroplastic dwarfism is dominant. But most mutations are recessive, like blue eyes. You have to have two genes to have blue eyes. Whereas if you have a brown eye gene and a blue eye gene, you're going to get brown eyes or cystic fibrosis is recessive, or diabetes, or many. And it takes up to 20 generations for recessive mutations to express themselves. So we're talking about eons of time for expression of genetic disease. That's the second thing. The third thing is if the man's got plutonium in his testicles and every male in the Northern Hemisphere has a tiny load in his gonads from weapons testing days and plutonium is still falling out. And the man's cremated. The smoke goes up the chimney with the plutonium so you can breathe it in, another man can. And it's ad infinitum because plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years and lasts for a long time. But the other thing is that the body thinks plutonium is iron. It's an iron analogue. So it's stored in the liver where it causes liver cancer. It's stored in the bone marrow to pour, cause um, to produce haemoglobin in the red blood cells, but it causes leukaemia or, or bone cancer. It uh, crosses the placenta into the developing embryo, which lets nothing through it, incidentally, except plutonium and a few other nasties. It, it got, it's stored in the uh, testicle too. So it's a ubiquitous, really dangerous isotope. And from the time they discovered it in the Manhattan Project, they knew its dangers. Does plutonium come only from nuclear weapons testing, or is there a risk of it escaping from nuclear power plants as well? It's not emitted by power plants routinely. Routinely, power plants emit radioactive ele elements all the time. Tritium, they cannot prevent tritium escaping. Highly carcinogenic. It's um, hydrogen, radioactive hydrogen, H3. Highly carcinogenic. That's probably what's causing a cancer in the kids living around the reactors in Germany. Carbon-14, highly carcinogenic. Xenon, krypton, argon are all emitted. And they say, oh, it's just routine. Like I could say, oh, you've just got a routine cancer. Don't worry about it. That sort of thing. Plutonium doesn't escape until there is an accident like a meltdown or an explosion like Fukushima or Chernobyl. Three Mile Island had a meltdown. I remember when I first read a book about nuclear power and it was called Poison Power by Dr. Goffman and Tamplin. My hair nearly fell out on the desk. I'd never read anything so dangerous. And they still go along with it. I can't tell you how indignant as a physician I feel about that. Having helped so many children die of cystic fibrosis, the commonest fatal genetic disease of childhood, which will be increased by plutonium, having helped children die of leukaemia. 
what are we talking about? How precious is life? We're we going to kill people? So going forward, Dr. Caldicott, what would you like to see done? I want an informed democracy. That's what Jefferson said. An informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And it's like I have to inform a patient. Say you, I have to tell you you've got pancreatic cancer. I have to tell you what it means, where your pancreas is, how it operates, where the cancer could metastasize, what sort of treatment you might need, the side effects of that, what your prognosis is. You must be educated. That's the practice of medicine. Now the earth is in an intensive care unit, acutely clinically ill. And we all must understand what is happening, what the pathology is, the pathogenesis, because we all are in fact physicians to a dying planet. Dr. Caldicott, thank you very much. channel of uncompromising stories world news documentaries entertainment and culture link tv connecting you to the world for more information visit linktv.org